Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Amen. I'm Reverend Henry Falcone from Flame of Fire Ministries. Blessing to be with you tonight. Praise God. Praise God for that. Just making sure we're on Facebook and all that good stuff tonight. Can't tell if we are yet, but hopefully we will be. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise you tonight, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. How good is our God, amen? He is good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give it a few minutes to get everything okay, going. It looks like we're on. Praise God. Whoops, <laughs> I can hear myself, okay. Hello, Sister Patricia, God bless you. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Okay, I got I got the chats on. Praise the Lord. Nice to be with everyone tonight. Good morning, Sister Lynn. God bless you. Amen. What a blessing to have our Sister Patricia back on tonight. Yay! I'm debating whether we should go back to mornings or go stay on the evenings. Amen. Um, so we'll have to pray and see what works out better, what the Lord wants, whether to go back to daytime or keep them at the evening times. Uh, um, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work any time for people. So it's just a matter of catching it on the, on the, um, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, um, recordings. That's the word I want. I'm trying to get the mic out of the way tonight a little bit. Let's see if I can get this. All right. Let's see. Uh, that's a little better. So I can see yeah, that, that will work better. Okay, good, 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 good. Amen. Well, I hope everyone's doing well. Amen. Looking forward to all that the Lord has for us tonight. And his goodness, his mercy, his grace. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We praise you tonight. We just bless you. We just bless you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. You are so good to us, Lord. You're the God who gave Abraham against hope, believed in hope, that he would become the father of many nations, even as, even as you said, Lord. He didn't consider the deadness of his, his Sarah's womb and, and Lord, the deadness of his body. But he was fully persuaded, Lord, that what you said you were able to do, you would do. That's how we approach you today, Lord. We are persuaded that what you said we will become, we will do, Lord, and Lord, in this kingdom time, we believe you. That that what you said you would do in us and through us, you will do in our families and our churches, ministries, our cities and our nations, Lord. And we give you glory tonight, Lord. We give you praise tonight, Lord. We thank you tonight, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hello, Lord. We just bless you tonight. Hello, Lord. Thank you for being with us here tonight, Lord. Thank you for being in our homes with us. Thank you for your manifested presence. And we hear the knock at your hearts today. We say, come in, Jesus. We say, come in and sup with us, eat with us, and we will eat with you, Lord. And we thank you for that supping tonight, Lord, that you draw us closer to you, open our eyes to see you more, hear you more, know you more, Lord. Lord, that you reveal your glory. Show us your glory if we have found favor in your sight, Lord, so that we can be one with you in a greater dimension, Lord. We so love you tonight, Lord. We appreciate you. We appreciate you so much tonight. We give you honor and praise and glory, Lord. We appreciate you, Lord. We so appreciate you, Father. We appreciate, we appreciate you, Abba. We appreciate you, Jesus. We appreciate you, Holy Spirit. We appreciate you, three in one. We thank you so much for who you are and who you are in us. Lord, thank you that you disconnected us from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by your blood and by your flesh, Jesus, that you, you reconnected us to the tree of life that's in the midst of the garden. Thank you for letting us to eat from that tree and only that tree for the rest of our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. 
We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Diana, God bless you, my sister. Amen. Praise God. It's such a blessing to be with each and every one of you tonight. Marie, God bless you. Glad you could join tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The other night, on Tuesday night, I was going to go, felt the Lord had put all day to me to go in one direction. And then when I got there, it just, I just felt like the brakes and I just had to worship the Lord. And as I was worshiping the Lord and I sang that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, I haven't seen, I haven't sung that song in ages, beloved. But when I did, Luke chapter 14 opened up before me. I had to share what the Lord was giving me on Luke chapter 14. That the hour, at, at that very hour, he sent out his servant to say, come, all things are now ready. And the invited ones all one by one made excuses. So I had to share that. And I pray that if you got a chance to listen to it, you know, that you would share it with others. You know, that may be at that crossroads of their walk with the Lord. Thank you, Father. Uh, tonight, I would like to begin with a Song of Solomon. So if you do have your Bibles, if you could go over to Song of Solomon with me. i try to put this light on. Give me a little bit more light. It kind of, kind of, put it there. Okay. I don't think it makes everything too bright. I hope not. If, if it's too bright, let me know. The Song of Solomon. A book that begins with a verse like this, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. Then realizing Solomon had arrived and had heard her speech, she turns to him and says, for your love is better than wine. And she continues, the odor of your ointment is fragrance. Your name is like perfume poured out, therefore do the maidens love you. This is a really interesting way to begin a book. But if you want to understand the marriage supper of the lamb, this is the place to come. What is the Lord doing right now? Why is the Lord desiring from us to come to him? You know, why well, this is a season of coming more than it is a season of going. Coming to him. Because if we do, and we hear that knock, and we open up the door, and we let him in. He desires to come in and he's going to sup with us. He's going to feed us and we're going to feed him. Now, I want, you to, I want you to see that the very first thing that she does is she feeds the Lord. Remember, he says, I'm going to come and eat with you, you know, and you'll eat with me. We have something to feed the Lord, and he has something to feed us with. And she feeds him with that which he desires. And because she begins to give him what he desires from her, it changes her life completely. And just like now, it's changing our lives completely. As, as God is awakening many, many, many in the body of Christ to fall in love with him. And those that were in love with him are becoming in love with him even more. Those, are, those, those that are falling in love with the Lord, pursuing the Lord, seeking the Lord's face, his desires, his, and giving the totality of their life to the Lord completely, that he might become the Lord Jesus Christ, the king over their lives, to be the king bridegroom over their lives. There is a stirring. There's an activation of the pure holy love in their hearts beginning to explode like a volcano. It's getting so strong and so powerful that it's burning up every other desire in our lives, every other desire, every other distraction that would take us away from the Lord. This desire for the Lord, this in love with the Lord, this love sickness with the Lord that God is raising up within his people is causing us to arise and soon we're going to shine for the light has come. But there's no arising without us returning to our first love. There's no arising into the glory realm without absolutely being ravishly in love with Jesus. And, and if you are ravished, ravishingly in love with the Lord, you're hearing that knock on the, on the door continually. And you're opening it up. And you desire for the Lord to walk through that door. See, my door in my office right now is closed. But, you know, I'm expecting him to walk through that door with his manifested presence. And when he does, everything stops. And when he does, everything stops. And we enter that glory realm where the Lord can begin now to do as he wishes, speak as he wishes, impart to us what he wishes, and share his heart and the secrets and the mysteries of, of, of his heart and of his kingdom with us because we've been aching for him, desiring him, loving him. Oh, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so she begins to feed him. This is not just a 
prayer of a Shulamite woman for, for Solomon. This is a prophetic utterance of what in love looks like. What does in love sound like? And now we're going to see what happens when the Lord comes in this marriage supper time that we're in right now. What is the Lord going to do with us? How he's going to work within us? How he's going to accelerate us and prepare us to, to, to go forth out of this wilderness, leaning upon our love and into the very end time purposes of the Lord, prepared, positioned, and propelled with the glory of the Lord. That's what this is all about. This is why this is such an incredible time. Amen. Sister Lasso, God bless you. Amen. You see, we could go, we could run and do the work of the Lord right now and run out and do a lot of things for the Lord. But, but, but in the midst of all that religious activity and all that the church is doing, the Lord is standing there hiding behind the lattice. You'll see in Song of Solomon, he's waiting to see who will notice him. He's looking for those who want him. He's choosing a bride out from the midst of the daughters. Not everybody's going to be the bride. The bride has to be chosen. That's why this ten. That's why the ten virgins is five wise and five foolish. The five foolish enter into the marriage supper. The five. I mean, the five wise enter the marriage supper. The five foolish don't. And the Lord, you have to be chosen as a bride. And that's why it's, it's and and Revelation nineteen seven says the bride has made herself ready and she's been permitted. So there's a readiness, there's a work that we must do right now in this hour, a preparation to prepare us to walk together with our bridegroom king on the face of this earth. As mature sons, as mature daughters, as a man-child company, as overcomers, you know, as, as um, uh, a wheel within a wheel. There's a spiritual preparation that God is doing right now. And it starts with this, being in love. You can buy, you can try to bypass it and come in some other way, like a thief and a robber. You can try to go after the Lord for his power, for his glory, for his, you know, and so that you can take dominion. And you know what? The Lord may even allow you to do it. He may even allow you if you persist enough. That doesn't make you right with the Lord. He gave them what they wanted in the wilderness, remember, but then he caused leanness to come into their soul. That's right. After they ate that quail, after he gave them what they wanted, they had leanness in their soul. They were never able to discern them the same again because he gave them leanness in their soul. They, he, he decreased their capacity for him. I don't ever want my capacity for the Lord to be decreased. I want it increased. You see, the Lord is moving. He walked with Adam. And then he walked, you know, and he kept walking through Noah. And he walked with Abraham and he walked with Isaac and Jacob. And then he walked with Moses and then he walked with the prophets and then he walked with David. And then he walked all through the ages until he came to physically walk on the earth as a, and the word made flesh. And he continued to walk after the day of Pentecost by filling them with his very presence. And he's been walking all through the centuries and he's walking all the way until now. That walking means intimate fellowship. And now, beloved, we are about to enter into the deepest intimate fellowship with the Lord anyone could ever experience. It's the day of the bride and bridegroom. The glory of God is revealing the bride and the bridegroom together as one. I said this glory is oneness and oneness is glory. There's a language of glory. Let's say that again. There's a language of glory. It's the language of in lovers. In lovers, those that are in, when I say in lovers, that means in love with Jesus. Those that are in lovers with the Lord and they have the language of glory upon their lips. So when they, when, they, when they speak, they speak the very words of glory that the Lord of glory wants to hear. And as they speak the words of, of the, the, when they speak the words filled with the pure holy love that God has placed within them for our Lord, they begin to speak glory's language. Glory's language is perfect love. I'm gonna say that again, glory's language is perfect love and perfect love casts out what? All fear, there's no fear in love. But that per that perfect that perfect love is 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 the glory words of his in lovers. Song of Solomon is all about in love. It's about in love relationship. And if you look at the last days church, where are those that are in love with the Lord? There are many who love the Lord. There are many that love the things of God. There are many that love the works of God. But how many are there that are in love with the Lord Himself? I mean, passionately. You can always tell them when you find them. There's something different about them. You can tell those who love the Lord because they're working for the Lord. But you can also tell those that are in love with the Lord because they're not just working for the Lord. They're dwelling with the Lord and the Lord is dwelling with them. They're not dwelling in the work of the Lord. They're dwelling in the Lord. 
Many in the church age, many fivefold ministers are dwelling in the work of the Lord. He's in it, but he, they're dwelling in the work. I want to dwell in him. Matter of fact, that's what Jesus said, dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Live in me and I live in you. Live in me and I will live in you. Dwell in my love and my love will dwell in you. See, that's what in love's all about. There's a language of in love. And it's the, it's the, it's, I'm going to first talk about the language of being in love. And then I'm going to talk about the prayer of in love. So we're going to talk about tonight. And then the place of in love. Three things we're going to reveal tonight by the spirit of God. If God allows me to do it in this one broadcast, it's the language of in love. Amen. It's the prayer of in love. And then it's the place of in love. Because all of that, all that I'm talking about is the entrance into the glory realm. Because it's this, it's through these ways that we come up into that third heaven place with the Lord, where he brings his in lovers. He brings his in lovers. And his in lover apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists, electricians, nurses, school kids, teenagers, young people, elderly. Homemakers, if you can still use that term today. He brings them all into that same place. All the in lovers of the Lord come into the same place. They enter into the realm of glory. Amen. So this is really why it's important. There is a language of glory. There is a prayer of glory. And there is a placement of glory. And these three things are critical for us to enter into the glory realm of the Lord where his glory can unfold in our lives. Now, I want you to think about it. Glory is oneness with God. And oneness with God is glory. Jesus said, Father, the glory that you give in me, I give them in John chapter 17, that as I am in you and you are in me, that they and we shall be one, perfectly united. Oneness is glory. Oneness is where you share heart to heart. Oneness is when two hearts come together and beat as one. That two, you know, your your desires get consumed by his desires. Oneness is I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ now lives in me. Oneness is I am my beloved and his desires are towards me. All the self life has been removed and you're living only for the purposes of the Lord. And so much so that you're in love with him and you want to. You see, in the church, we try to. In the In the kingdom age, we want to. We try to love the Lord. We try to be in love with the Lord. But there's a supernatural intervention of God called the wedding at Cana that the Lord's doing right now, where he's taken those that are in love and he's going to complete them. He's going to change them from water into new wine. And that's glorious. I'm going to take a little drink of my coffee. There is a language of in love. And if you've ever been in love, you know it. You know, people who can love you, love you. That's the, that the kids say, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. And it's almost like, eh, okay, that's a nice saying. But when in love speaks, it's totally different. And it's and you can start in love and you can go out of love. And people have started in love with the Lord and they've grown out of love because God did not, it, God did not do the things they thought the way that he would, they wanted him to do it. Just like in a marriage, people go out of in love because they give up on each other. They forget each other's value. All they see is each other's faults or what they didn't do. Most people who fall out of love always find what's wrong with people and with their spouse. When they always dwell on the things that are wrong with their spouse or their children, that in love relationship is broken. When you're in love, you find the good. You find the valuable. You find what's beautiful. When you're in love, it, it almost blinds you to the faults. But in God, there are no faults. He's perfect love. That's why when we fall in love with perfect love, we get changed by that perfect love because he doesn't see us with our faults. He sees us through his blood. He sees us through the blood of Jesus. He sees us redeemed, bought and paid for and restored back to our original tension. And that's why he's ravishly in love with us. That's why he's coming back for, for a glorious church without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. Amen. He loves us so much and he's in love so much that he has to finish us and complete us. And this is a time where we have to come really intimately in love with the Lord like never before. That, that capacity to be in love must increase with a, within us if we're going to walk in the glory realm. If the glory of God is going to be seen risen upon us. The only way glory can be seen upon you is by that in love relationship with the Lord. Not working more for the Lord. That's the mistake the church is making. I, the more I work for the Lord, the more he's going to love me. Not so. Not so. Not so. I said this the other day. The church paints the picture as of, of Jesus as an employer 
and we're his employee. Be faithful to wash the toilets. Be faithful to sweep the floors. Be faithful to give your tithe. Be faithful to come to every church service. Be faithful to come to all of our activities. And if you do, and you're faithful to doing all those things, then you'll get position, power, authority, dominion. Do you see what that relationship? That is a employer and employee relationship. The Song of Solomon does not enfold Jesus, our King, our bridegroom, the King of glory, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as an employer. He's revealed as our husband king, our, our, what's it, our, our, uh, I forgot what the term is. I'll remember it later. Okay. Our kings, our kinsman redeemer, right? He's revealed himself as the king of glory. And love has a language. And the church has lost that in love with that in love language over these past centuries because We've deserted him. We've abandoned him, that love that we should have for him. So there is a movement of the Lord calling those that have been cold and lukewarm to get back on fire in love with the Lord. And those that have been in love with the Lord, those of you that have been in your prayer closet, those of you that came out of the church system and the religious system and the Babylonian church system, you that in love now is about to go into the deepest and highest realm of glory you've ever known. So get ready. That in love and that in love desire for you is going to be so filled and so complete that his glory is going to be what seen risen upon you. You ready for that, beloved? Is that awesome? Thank you, Lord. When you're in love, okay, you don't see everybody's flaws. You see, you see them the way Jesus sees them. When you look at your spouse, you see them the way that the Lord sees them. When the enemy is hitting you to get you out of in love. He magnifies people's faults and failures, and he makes them very big in your eyes so that you see what they don't do. They see they you see how they hurt you. They see the things that they're doing that makes your life more difficult. And it all you notice what happens when you get when you fall out of in love. It's all about you instead of being all about the Lord and about laying your life down for the one that you love. Now it becomes you become very self-centered when you fall out of love. It's all about you. It's all about your needs. That's why Jesus says to the Laodicean church, you, you say you're rich in need of nothing. It's all about you. But you don't realize your true spiritual state is blind, poor, and naked. Because they said, we're rich. We got it all. But the Lord said, no, you don't. You don't really have anything. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because you lost, you lost your real relationship with me. So there is a in love language. It's the language of glory. And I remember one time, I, you know, I had been sharing this. I think I said the other day at a, at a particular gathering of the saints. And man, when I went to the service on, on one of the services, that precious person of the Lord probably didn't realize what they were doing. But I believe a real demonic power whispered in the ear and they really spoke against the scripture of Song of Solomon. And uh, um chapter one, verse two. I don't even think they realized they did it because I know that person very well and they would never do that deliberately. But it was like a slap in the face to being in love with the Lord. That the, you, you can't see the Lord like that. And you won't see the Lord like that as long as he's your employer. I have to work for the Lord. The Lord's looking at my works. You know, faith without works is dead, right? But they also said the Lord is going to test those works in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, I'm going to test them. And if your works are out of the pure, holy love of, love of the Lord, you'll get precious jewels and medals. But if those works that you have done are not out of that pure love of the Lord built on the right foundation, they're going to burn up. And you, everything's going to burn up your whole life. But you yourself will enter into heaven, but only by escaping the fire. So the Lord is going to try our works, isn't he? To see what's, what's of him and what isn't. The only way to make sure that your works are going to last comes from the in love relationship with the Lord. It comes from the in love relationship with the Lord. And tonight, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the language, the glory language. The glory language of the kingdom is a, a, is a heart that speaks out of that in love place with the Lord. And that's exactly if you take a look at Song of Solomon now, chapter one, verse two, you're going to hear the love language of glory. This is not what you hear in church. This is not how we this is not how we talk to the Lord. You know, Lord, thank you for what you did. And nothing wrong with entering his gates with thanksgiving, entering his courts with praise. 
But you don't really hear this type of language when we gather together. We should. Each individual should love the Lord like that. Each individual should come with their alabaster box filled with oil to pour upon the feet of the Lord because that's what the worship is. Worship is to be, is for the Lord. Worship is not for us. I heard a major minister's wife say, worship is not for God, it's for us. No, it is not. Man, that's really sick, right? That's what they said in very mid, huge church here in the United States. They said, worship is for us. It's not really for the Lord. Well, that's contrary to what God told me. He said, Henry, when you love worship and you leave that worship service saying, wasn't worship good today? You worship to worship. You felt good by what you did. He said, worship is for me. It's supposed to make me feel good. Man, I mean, that was such a word of the Lord to me that whatever my worship is for the Lord is not about how I feel. It's about how he feels. Is it real? Is it genuine? Is it love? When I'm lifting up my hands to the Lord, is it out of that pure holy love? When I'm singing, when the tears are streaming down my face, is it because I'm, I'm absolutely in love with him? Because that's the worship the Father seeks. That's the worship Jesus seeks. That's the worship that's in spirit and truth. And there's a language to it. And chapter, chapter one, verse two, is the language of what, how do you feed the Lord in Revelation 3.20 when he comes in and to eat with you? Well, when you invite somebody into your house and you're going to feed them dinner, you got to put out a meal, right? And usually if it's a king, you're going to give them your very best, right? You're going to, you're not going to give them a hot dog and a hamburger unless he asks for it. But man, if you could make filet mignon or you can make baked stuff shrimp or you can make uh, lamb or whatever, the, uh, the best meal that you can possibly ever think, you know, roast duck. I never had duck, but whatever. And you want to set that table beautifully. And you want that food to be exquisite. Why? Because you're feeding a king. Well, how do you feed the king in love words? And what is he looking for when he comes into that house, into, into that heart? And why is he standing at, on the outside of the church, at the end of the church age, on the outside knocking, trying to get back in? Well, if we deserted him our first love and we become lukewarm, that tells us that our relationship now is not where it was supposed to be. He's on the outside instead of on the inside and his desires to come back what on the inside. It also shows us that it's the end of the church age. There's no more place to go because after Jesus comes in and, and someone lets him in and, and subs with him, the only place from there is to go up. Revelation 3, 3 uh, 20, uh, 20 is all about the overcomers being seated with him. And Revelation chapter four, verse one is, behold, I heard that voice, the same voice as that I heard like a war trumpet calling me. And when I, when I, when I heard that voice, I looked up and behold, the door was standing where open in heaven. And I heard a voice cry out to me, what come up here. See, it's up from there, from every place after Revelation 3.20. It's an upward call, an upward journey. What? Upward into the heart of the Lord, up the mountain of the Lord, where the king of glory is. It's meeting him in the glory realm. And there are certain words. I'm, I'm going to share with you, and some of you have heard this story before, but how powerful they are. Because, and how it, how, when he hears this from a sincere heart, when a sincere heart says these words to the Lord, how it releases his glory and it attracts his glory to you. It attracts his glory to come to you. It attracts, it actually woos him to you. And she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his, of his lips. Her desire is she wants to kiss him. That's intimacy. I want to know his kisses. I want to know him as a lover, right? And then it says, then realizing Solomon arrived and has heard her speech, she turns to him and she says, for your love is better than wine. She, be, she looks at him and says, your love is better than wine. Wine, what does wine do? What, when you drink enough wine, you can be who you are. All the inhibitions come, come down, right? You ever see somebody a little tipsy? They'll just say anything. They just, whatever they really are comes out when they're tipsy. And that's what she says. When I'm with you, I can be everything that I am. I don't have to hide anything. I can be exactly what I'm supposed to be with you. I don't have to be afraid of you. I don't have to run away from you. I can be who I am because your love is better than wine. That's why I want to taste the kisses of your lips. And then she goes on to say in verse three, and the odor of your ointments is fragrant. What ointments? His cologne, your, your, your cologne, your smell of your aroma that comes forth from you, God, is so beautiful that it attracts me to you. 
I said this before. I only wear one cologne and it's fierce by Abercrombie. I used to have several, but I, I went down to one recently, many, many years ago. And I just felt like I wasn't supposed to have anyone because that, that is the aroma or the fragrance. Okay. That I felt I was supposed to wear just one fragrance, a consistent fragrance. So that when people know, yep, that Pastor Henry, that's, I, I smell, I smell that. And people compliment me all the time. I, I just love that cologne that you're wearing. You know, because it's attractive. Jesus is so attractive that there's an aroma that you can smell. You can smell his aroma. You can smell his fragrance. And she knows he's there. She knows he's near because she can smell him. She wants to taste the kisses of his lips. His fragrance, his cologne is drawing her to himself. Do you see what I'm saying? This, these are the words that she's bringing to a king that she's having supper with. She's about to have a marriage supper meal right here. And I want to show you that how worship brings us into intercession, that there are glory words in love words, the glory words, they're in lover, they're on in lover words and glory will words that release intercession, that release you into the place, into the place of intimacy with the Lord, a special place. Amen. Is this making sense to everybody tonight? Amen. She said, the odor of your ointment is fragrant. Your name is like perfume poured out. Your name. She's like saying it over and over. And it makes her love sick. The more she says his name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's like it's it, it's 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 like it's it's like a perfume poured out. Your name. It's so beautiful. How many songs have been written about his beautiful name? Where did that come from? Somebody got a revelation of him and his beauty and the beauty of his holiness. Your name. It's so beautiful. See, love sick people. What do they do? They write the they write the name of the, that one that's in love with. As teenagers, you know, you know, girls would write, you know, uh, Donna, uh, uh, Donna loves Henry, or Henry loves Donna. You know, and, and guys do it too. They they write the girl's name. I love Donna Falcone. I love you know. I I love Henry Falcone. I you know. And you would write that person's name when you're really love sick and in love. You go to those extremes. I remember one time I, before I met my wife, I, there was a girl I really liked. And that, in fact, that's how I met my, my wife was the fact that she knew this girl and I wanted her to break up with her boyfriend and go out with me. Her name was Tina. And um, so, I, I mean, I really thought I loved Tina. You know, I'm 16 years old. What do I know about love? Okay. Actually, I knew a lot about it once God opened my eyes to it. But, um, you know, I wanted to go out with her so bad. And, and so one day we went over to, um, um, it used to be Grant's. I think it was Grant's back in those. I think it was Grant's back in that day, you know, uh, back in the day, <laughs> you know, maybe you, some of you remember Grant's department store. And, uh, anyways, we're in the Norgetown mall and I'm there and she goes, do you really love me? I said, I, I said, I love you, Tina, so much. She goes, prove it. I said, well, how do you want me to prove it? And she said, well, if you really love me that much, I want you to get in this grocery cart and stand in it and i'm going to push it down and i want you to say henry loves tina henry loves tina henry loves tina well of course what do you think i did i got into the grocery cart and i stood there and she pushed it and i went down henry loves tina henry loves tina i think i loved her because her father owned a pizza place <laughs> no that's not the only reason but you know um but seriously uh, you know i was infatuated with her you know but look at the look at the depth that you'll go when you're in love that's what she's saying here your name is better than your, your name is like perfume poured out. And then she says, therefore, the maidens love you. This is love language. Most of men, most men in the body of Christ have no idea what this means. And what they, the many will pass over the Song of Solomon because it's too mushy. Or it's just about Solomon and Bathsheba, whatever. It's not. This is a prophetic allegorical book as well as a natural, but it's allegorical because it speaks and it speaks of our abiding relationship that we're supposed to have with the king. There are four people, four characters that are portrayed in the Song of Solomon. You got the Shulamite woman. You got the bridegroom king, Jesus. You got the daughters of Jerusalem, which represents the whole church. And then you got the stepbrothers, which represent church leadership. And they all... All three of them have an impact upon her life. But the whole Song of Solomon is the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
It's about the finishing work from taking her from where she is, a keeper of the vineyard, to a place of intimate oneness with the Lord, where she's ready to come out of that wilderness totally in one with the Lord. She's no longer dependent upon people, upon ministries, upon ministers. She's become one with the Lord. She's come mature. She's able to walk with the Lord. And this is the description of the man-child company or the bridal company or the overcomers or the full-grown sons and daughters of God. They come into that place of real intimacy with the Lord, real oneness with the Lord, filled with the love of the Lord, that they can walk singularly with the Lord. Singularly with the Lord. What does that mean? They no longer need men to teach them of the Lord or to walk with them. They're walking with the Lord himself. But here's the beautiful part. In maturity, because they can walk alone with the Lord, and, and you now walk alone with the Lord, and Lynn walks along with the Lord and Lisa uh, walks along with the Lord or Patricia. Guess what happens? Now all five of us, six of us, seven of us are able to walk along with the Lord. But now we walk out to collectively with the Lord. As you're one with the Lord, as I'm one with the Lord, we become one with the Lord as one body. And now each part supplies what the other needs because of that in love relationship with the Lord. Now we can function. We can function together. All knowing the Lord, hearing the Lord, submitting to the Lord in each one of us perfectly, hearing the Lord in each one of us, submitting to that in the love of the Lord where there's no competition, there's no strife, there's no division, there's nothing. There's just unity and pure holy love. Why? Because you're one with the Lord. I'm one with the Lord. And now the Lord makes us collectively one as a multi-membered body of Christ that he's going to fill as a temple, that he's making into a new Jerusalem city where he's going to rule and reign through this people as with, and giving them the power to rule over the nations with an iron rod because they've been ready as a bride. But now they can function as a bride, a priest, a king, and a son. All four characters, characteristics are developed in them. Isn't that beautiful? But I'm going to say this, and this is, this is where I weep a lot because there is a movement where many leaders, five ministers, are getting the revelation of God's government and kingdom. And they're trying to establish new governmental order without the bridal relationship, without the bridal and priestly ministry. That is, it's the first work of the Lord. And they're going to try to do it apart from that. And if you don't do it out of the bridal heart or the priestly part, you can only do it in your own power and in your own strength. And the Lord will let you. It won't last, but the Lord will let you. That's the scary part. But when, when, but when you're done, and just about when you think it's all there, it's going to fall apart. Why? Depart from me. I never knew you. I was never intimate with you. It's going to burn up if it doesn't change and be come forth from the tabernacle of David. Today, I changed my Facebook, uh, my Facebook page picture. The Lord had me put on. I change it often, you know, like in different prophetic seasons, and this is a new prophetic season. So I put the I put David's tabernacle up as the as the picture, the major picture on our flame, flame of fire there, because I felt that was what the Lord. That's where we are. That's where we are. We're being invited to come into the David's tabernacle to worship the Lord in true intimacy. And so I want you to hear the language of in love. Let me taste the kisses of your lips. Are you burning for Jesus like that? Would you ever say that to Jesus? I have. I have because he's birthed it in me. I've, I've, I've quoted these very scriptures, but not as quotes they have on my life. It's what God has worked in me. I want to know him like that. I want to know intimate. I had to get past the guy thing, you know what I'm saying? Because God's a spirit. I had, you know, because it's hard for a guy to say to the Lord Jesus, who has, you know, his, who, you know, obviously his spirit, but he came as a man to say that to him because it's not, we, we say it to women. But we are, his, we are men and women, his bride. And just as I can be a bride, a woman can be a son, which is amazing. Because why? There's no male or female in God. Because we're spirit beings. We're spirit beings. And we contain them. And we contain them. Now, I'm, you know, I have the male and my wife's a female, just the way God intended it to be. But the beautiful thing is the spirit that God made me and the spirit that made, God, made Donna can become one. And out of our oneness in the spirit and our oneness in the natural, we can produce children physically and spiritually. That's the beautiful part of God's plan. Amen. The reason why there's no 
Greek or no Jew or no, no male or no female is that she has the same spirit of God in her that I do. I'm a male and she's a female, right? And that's how God made it. Only two sexes, male and female. I'm sorry that the people are deceived today, but I can't help it. I haven't, say, I haven't seen a third kind. Because if I really look hard and I look at science, I don't care what they say they are or what they change themselves into. They are what they were when they were created. They can call themselves something else. They can change themselves to something else, but that doesn't change who they are. That's the deception about the whole dumb thing. But what are you going to do, right? Pray. Dear Lord. So that's her prayer. That's the in love language. It's different than church age love language where we occasionally say, I love you, Lord. I lift my voice. That's worship. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with this is the day. This is the day. But we're past that. Not as older folks, but your younger ones are all in elevation worship, hillsong worship, and, you know, all those things. And there's nothing wrong with those things. And if you notice today, loudness is the loudness is the is what many in the church are, are, are experiencing as the anointing. The louder we get, the more noise we make, the drums and the guitar and stuff like that. The only thing is that's not quite the right music for the chambers, the being his chambers. I don't think that's the music that you bring into that place of intimacy with the Lord. I don't think it would be the place you would bring it into intimacy with your husband or your wife. I don't think that would be the music you would want to listen to when you're sharing heart to heart, flesh to flesh, spirit to spirit. There's a love music. There's an in love music. And there are in love words. And there are in love there are, there are in love words that God loves to hear. Now, let me share with you. We've got a, a little bit more. A, a, a little, yeah, yeah. The, I, I can't do the loudness, Patricia. I hear you. I can't do it. I can't. You know, you know I don't, I, I'm not saying that makes me better. I just can't. Others can really find the Lord in that. Let them. Praise God. That's okay. I'm not where they are. They're not where I am. And nor would I put where I am on them. Or, or should they put that on me? Many people can find the Lord in, the, in today's music. There are some really beautiful songs that may go off a little bit loud. That's fine. I'm not, I'm not judging people's music or what they worship or how they meet the Lord. What God uses for you is for you. What God uses for me is for me. I just can't do that anymore. Now, there may be times where that can happen. There may be times where I've played loud, especially when God takes you into victory or into warfare or into, or into different ways that he wants to express himself. I, there's a place for all of that. This place where the drums will play like thunder and lightning. There's a place for that. But it's not something that we're making. It's something that God is making through us. We prophesy on our instruments. We prophesy in song. We sing the, unto the Lord a new song. So when that new music comes forth from the Lord's heart, it's by him. And that's what he wants to hear. Praise God. I think I got bit by something. In my, if you see me scratch back, I think I got bit by something. Ah, thank you, Lord. Now, just to give you a quick demonstration, and some of you have heard this story before. But I was in uh, San Marcos, California. And I'm just going to say the beginning part of this. Aaron and I were going to do worship. My son and I were going to do worship. He plays the drums and I play, you know, the keyboard. And just as I about to get up there, the Lord said, Henry, let the youth worship me. So I went to the pastor. I said, Pastor, I really felt the Lord said, let the youth worship them. I know they don't have any instruments, but maybe they just need to tell the Lord how, how much they love him. And he goes, okay. My fact, he had sat down with me and my wife and a couple of sisters and said, brother, these meetings are great. You have complete freedom. And I asked him, what does freedom mean to you? <laughs> because I've been in meetings where pastors said, you have complete liberty. But my idea of liberty and yours may be quite different, especially when it comes to the things of the spirit. But he said, okay. And so there was this young girl there. Her name was Elizabeth, just like my granddaughter. And she's 11, just like my granddaughter. <laughs> so we're going to be 11. She's going to be 11. But um I said, would you start us off in worship tonight? And I said, here. 
and I gave her what they call a glory chaser. It's a little, it, it's like a, I don't know what you call it. It looks like this and it's round and it has streamers off of it. They call it the glory chaser. I said, you know, would you just start us tonight and whatever you feel that you want to say to the Lord or worship him with, would you do that? And she said, yeah. I want you to listen. She could have done anything. She could have sang anything. She could have sang a song that she knew. She could have sang, you know, you know, um, Jesus, the lover of my soul. She could have said, I love you, Lord. She could have sang anything. You know what she did? She took, I want to talk to you about in love language. She took that glory chaser and she went like this. And she just said, I love you, Lord. She didn't sing it. She said, I so love you, Lord. And when she said those words, tears started dripping down her face. Lynn, you were there, so you can testify that, I, that this is the absolute true story. When she said it, tears came down her face. And when they did, the glory of God filled that room. I couldn't even stand up. I fell upon my face because that worship was so pure, so holy, so beautiful. From the depth of her being, from the depth of her being, the Lord was so blessed and so pleased. You see what she did? She opened up the doorway for him to come in and feed us. And what did he feed us with? His glory. And she said, she begins to cry. She says, Lord, what other words would you ever want to hear? What other words? Who shouldered this? What other words would you ever want to hear? But those words that I love you and I love you. And that's all she could say over and over. And prayer, crying and tears coming down her face. The glory of God so came and filled that room that the pastor's son, who was seven, got up and began to pace the floor. And all he kept saying is, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And he's crying and he's weeping because the Lord is showing him and beginning, the glory is beginning to come. You see, the Lord is going to show these youth the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom. And he starts crying, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And then he says these words. He says, Lord, you give us 10 trillion billion hours and we don't even give you 30 minutes. We don't even give you 30 minutes a day, Lord. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And he's crying and he's weeping. And then he says, Lord, Lord, we're stuck. Your people are stuck. Your pastors are stuck. They don't know how to bring us into the promised land. They think we want more games and pizza, but we want your presence. You see? That was a love language. We want you. We want your we want we want your presence. It's not fair. You do all this. We should be giving you all this. Do you see what a love language looks like? And it was revealed to kids. Glory has an in love language. And when the church begins to speak that in love language, when a group of people can gather together and bring God that in love language, that which he wants to hear, that which blesses his heart, he comes and he manifests himself in his glory. And what that glory does is it begins to cause us to come into the second thing I said. I said, these love, in love words release in love prayers. In love intercession, because our heart begins to cry out. The deep within us begins to cry out for the deep of God. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb I'm talking about. This is what the Lord is doing right now on the earth and those that are seeking him. This is a generation that will seek him. Seek his face as their vital need. It is so beautiful. It is so beautiful. Powerful. Amen, Sister Lisa. I can't read everything everybody's writing, but you, I, I, I'm going to go back and read them after. But I know what you're adding is right on, sisters and brothers. It was so powerful that this young man, okay, just began to pray. Then you can testify with me. He he prayed over an hour and a half. We couldn't move. I was undone. I couldn't move. I was stuck to the floor. I'm serious. No one could move. And many of the church ran up to the altar at this time. 
The ones that didn't run up to the altar were the seven pastors that were there and a few people. That says something, doesn't it? Not to be judgmental, but why didn't they move? Because they weren't used to the language. They didn't, I, I can look back now 11 years later and say, I know why they didn't come because they didn't understand love's language when you only understand work language. When it's all about working for the Lord, God is your employer. Jesus is your employer and you're his employee. So love language in love language makes no sense to you. It's too mushy. It has no place in your life. It has no place in your ministry because you have to work. That's the only way you've seen the Lord and known the Lord, the God of the work. But there are people who love they 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 love the work of God, but there are people who love the God of the work more than the work. Where many leaders and churches and ministries are based on loving the work of the Lord more than the God of the work. And this is what God is adjusting. That's what 2020 was all about, to stop us from all the work so that we could turn around and repent and fall in love with him again. Be with him again and begin to bring the language of the kingdom. The language of the kingdom is the language of the kingdom of love. We think the language of the kingdom of love is love one another as I have loved you. That's what we say. We're supposed to love one another as I have loved you. No greater love than this. And a man lay down his life for his friends. Absolutely the truth. But there is an in love language that is personal. It's personal to God. And it's God personally to you. It's a personal language of intimacy, an intimacy of oneness, an intimacy of sharing your heart, an intimacy of sharing your desires, an intimacy of the two becoming one. That's what she, that's what Elizabeth did. Who taught her that? The Holy Spirit. And this young man paced back and forth over the floor. It was amazing. And then that glory touched a, I want you to see something here. Well, I'm going to hold that because that goes to the next part. Place, remind me, Lynn, remind me. I got to talk about place. Pure intercession came up and a desire, Lord, it's not fair. You give us 10 billion million hours and we give you 30 minutes. It's not fair. If you could see a seven-year-old crying, pacing the floor, I've never seen it. I've never forgotten it. I've shared it everywhere I've gone just about. And he says, Lord, they think we want more pizza and more gains, but we want your presence. He was desperate for the presence, the manifested presence of the Lord. And he said, we're stuck. Your people are stuck. Your church is stuck because your pastors are stuck. They don't know how. What a word. They don't know how to bring us into the promised land, which is the kingdom realm. He didn't know what he was saying, but they don't know how to bring us into the kingdom age, into the promised land. And they don't. And they many still don't. Why? Because we haven't learned the language of in love. We haven't learned glory and love language because we've taken our time to build our, our oneness with God in working for the Lord instead of being with the Lord. First. So she is giving the Lord, she is feeding him, the Shulamite woman here. And out of her love language, a new prayer, a three-part prayer comes into existence. And and it's called the three threefold prayer of desire. This prayer is what expands your capacity for the glory of the Lord. This prayer is a prayer of desperation, a prayer that takes us out of the church age into the kingdom age. It's the prayer that the Lord is looking for. And what is it? It's not our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, though that is how the Lord taught us how to pray. And boy, at this last convergence, with that, that prayer became like thunder to us. But this is a different prayer. This is a personal prayer, a personal prayer of desire. And it's got three parts. Let's read it in verse four. Draw me. That is the key. Draw me. Now she is so lovesick. She's so desperate. She's asking him to draw her, her spirit to his. She wants to be with him. Is that the in love language we heard last Sunday? Let's go back and listen to all the preaching and all the teaching. What did you hear? Church age or kingdom age? What did you hear? Employer, employee 
or bride and bridegroom, or maybe a little bit of both. Just wondering. But you see, she now has looked at him. She sees him. And Jesus, she's opened the door. She said, come in. Come in, Jesus. And she feeds him. We have something to feed the Lord. Elizabeth fed the Lord. What other words would you ever want to hear, Lord? But I love you. Andy fed the Lord. Lord, you give us 20 billion trillion hours and we give you 30 minutes. It's not fair. It's not fair. We're stuck. Your pastors are stuck. They think we want more peace and gains, but Lord, we want your presence. You can you can, can you can you just imagine how the glory increased when he started praying like that? She started it and the glory came and it increased to a second level and it's going to increase to a third level where nobody could move. Why? Because the Lord found what he was looking for. Can I say that again? The Lord found what he was looking for. The saddest thing about it is the pastors rejected it and they rejected the kids. Just like they did when the Lord came down on the mountain to meet with Israel, they, 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 they ran away and said, get away from us lest we die. Moses, you talk to God and we'll do everything he said. That's exactly what the pastor did. They ran away from the Lord because they could not see him as a lover. They could only see him as an employer. Wow. This is pretty powerful that God is showing us tonight his ways into his kingdom. Praise God. She's prayers, draw me. See, that's the prayer of desire. Draw me. Lord, what other words would you want to hear? See, that's the same as draw me. It's not, you don't have to just say draw me. You're draw me, made. Lord, I want you. I am desperate for you. Let me taste the kisses of your lips. Lord, I am so in love with you. I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to hear you. That may be your draw me. But that prayer that's burning inside of you for him, to be one with him, to be married to him, must be expressed out of you. That's what you feed the Lord. I'll come in and I'll eat with you and you'll eat with, with me. We feed him, he feeds us. We feed him our pure worship. That's what we feed the Lord. We give the Lord our pure love, our pure worship, and the Lord gives us our kingdom. I'm gonna say that again. We, we give the Lord our pure love and worship, and he gives us a kingdom that starts with the king. We have the king first. We're in love with the king first. We're married to the king first. And then we walk together in the unfolding of his kingdom, the unfolding of his glory as the bride and the bridegroom. Draw me. I encourage you. This is something you can easily do. When you get up tomorrow morning, don't pray for anything. Just come to meet the Lord and lift, maybe lift up your hands like this and just pray this three-part prayer. Draw me, Lord. Just say the first part. Draw me, Lord. And then whatever else comes out of your mouth after that, look for him. Look to feed him. Invite him in. Say, I hear you knocking. And I open up my heart and I say, come in, Jesus. Come in. Sup with me and I'll sup with you. And I sup with him by saying, draw me. And see, that's the, that's the prayer of desire. That, 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 that shows the Lord. When you mean that, that shows the Lord you are now singularly interested in him. You're beginning to develop a dove's eyes. Doves have two eyes, but they have single vision. Now her affection is just for the Lord. And when, when Andy said, you know, when Andy said, what other words would you want to hear? Excuse me. No, when, when Elizabeth said, what other words would you want to hear? And Andy said, he said to him, Lord, it's not fair. They think we want more pizza and games, but we want your presence. They were saying, draw me, Lord. And you know what happens when he finds that heart? He, that's why I had to put this behind me. I had to change, I had blessed, I had that on my other wall, but the Lord told me to get that, that scripture for this broadcast series. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James 4, 5. So I had to put it up there. If you notice the two hearts with the arrow of love going through it, I'm trying to paint a prophetic picture here for you. I, actually, it was my wife's idea. <laughs> she did it. I give her all the credit, you know, because she's the one that did it. I found the sign. I like this sign I found, but she found the hearts and blessed them. Oh, and we had blessed there. Once you pray that prayer of draw me and you wait on the Lord, 
and you say, Lord, what are the words do I want to hear? And you just love the Lord and you wait. And be quiet, be still, and wait for him to draw you. Wait for his lifting presence to bring you up. And when you feel him being lifted up, that's when you begin to pour out that love upon him. And as you pour out that love upon him, wait a little bit longer and he'll take you even higher. And then all of a sudden that drama becomes even a greater intensity of prayer. Notice I said there's the in love words and then there's in love intercession. And here it is. We will run after you. Now, when I look, there's no we here. And I learned this from my spiritual father. What's the we? It says we will. She's by herself. Draw me. And then she says we. The we is the totality of her being. She's saying, I give you my body, my soul, and my spirit. All that I am. We. Everything you made me. My body, soul, and spirit. That's the totality of your being. You see, that's where she's presenting herself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. And that's what the Lord's looking for to, to us to feed him with. We give ourselves. We present ourselves to him what, as a living sacrifice. My body, soul, and spirit. One way of saying that is all that I am, all that I have, and all that I ever will be is yours. And you bring that. All that you are before the Lord said, we, Lord, I have one, I have one desire. We'll run after you. And the, in other words, I'm going to know you. I'm going to pursue you. I want to apprehend, Paul said, I want to apprehend him who's apprehended me. And we will run after you it means I'm going to pursue you with every fiber of my being. I want to know you. I want to see you. That my whole life is consumed in knowing you. Well, that's what eternal life is, to know the one true God in Jesus Christ who sent. This is a commitment. Her prayer is drawing me. Now she's making a commitment, a new commitment, a kingdom commitment, a bridal commitment, a marriage supper commitment. We will run after you. These are the words the Lord desires for us to hear. They may not be exactly said the same way, but when he finds this, this is what attracts the glory. This is what causes his perusia to surround you. This is what causes God's approbation or his favor to come upon you as if you were the only person in the world. And now he's going to deal with you and work with you and live with you and draw you as if there was nobody else on the earth. Your personal relationship with the Lord gets developed here. This is where he takes you from being a child into a man, from a child into a woman, from a child to a full grown son and daughter. As your intimacy with him grows, we do not grow into maturity by the gifts of the spirit. They're without repentance. We don't grow into intimacy. We don't go into maturity by operating in a fivefold ministry gift. We come into maturity by the maturity of our love, intimate relationship with the Lord. It's the in love relationship that brings us into maturity because in that in love relationship, you change, you're transformed, and you live for only one desire, the one you're in love with. You let everything about you change so you can satisfy the heart of the one you love. That's what the Lord's doing right now and those, and he's accelerating it. That's why you may be burning tonight. Why am I so burning in love with the Lord? And why do I hear loudly all around me, work, 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 harvest, 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 this, 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 gifts, 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 miracles, 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 signs, signs, wonders, reach the Lord, do this. Not that those things aren't the gospel, they are. And there are many, many, many workers, but there are few lovers. And out of the workers, out of the daughters, the Lord is looking for a bride. See, we think it's all about work. No, it's all about the Lord finding a bride for himself. Because the day's going to come where there's no more people to be saved. There's no more people to be healed. And in that day, he'll have a bride that he will rule over the nations and over the world with side by side forever and forever. And that is so beautiful. In that in love relationship, God will take you to the poor, to the blind, to the lame. In that in love relationship, he'll bring you to those that are sick. He'll cause you to go to that are dead. He will take you there just as the father took him everywhere that he needed to go out of that in love relationship with his father and his father's in love relationship with him. Look at what Jesus did. And he said, the works that I do, you shall also do. Why? Because you're now one with us as I was one with the father. So all those things that we, that everyone wants to do will still be done, but it won't be done without the in love relationship. It won't be done with God as our employer and we're his employee because when he's your employee, there's one thing that comes with God as your employee. You demand your paycheck. And that's where people walk away from the Lord because you didn't do what I asked. I thought if I did all these things for you, Lord, my life would be like this. I thought my ministry would be here. You know how many people have given up on the Lord, turned their back on the Lord because they only saw him as an employer? 
Many left the Lord. And in the last days, many are going to fall away. And they're falling away. Why? Because you are a hard taskmaster. Because that's the only way they saw him. They only see Jesus as a taskmaster. And pastors and leaders and Bible ministries, that's how we portrayed him as a taskmaster. Work, 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 work. And someday you'll satisfy God. You'll hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well, let me get it straight with you tonight, brothers and sisters. I learned this from my spiritual father. Well done does not mean much done. Well done, thy good and faithful servant doesn't mean much done. Well done means the quality. The quality of what you did was out of the pure, holy love of God. That's why the one that had two talents and produced two more talents got the same reward as the one that got five and five more because of the quality of the work, not the quantity. The church age is about quantity. The kingdom is about quality. And that's why I keep saying over and over, and again, I learned this from my spiritual father, the old Zenith commercial, the quality goes in before the name goes on. And the, now, now we're ready for the third part of that prayer. What, what is that prayer? We will run after you. But the third part of the prayer to me is even the most beautiful part because she says, she says, um, the king brings me into his chambers. The destination, notice, is not the cross. It's the chambers. That's the throne room. That's the bridal bedroom. That's the place of the deepest intimacy. The king will bring me into his chambers because what happens in the chambers? We enter into the glory realm of God. The third heaven. When we get into that glory realm of God, we begin to fellowship with him on a brand new level as one with him. It's here as his bride. He can trust you with his secrets, his, his, his secrets, his mystery, secrets and his mysteries. He can trust you with his dominion, power, and authority because you would never use it apart from him. You won't move without him. You won't live without him because you said, we will run after you. And so now that you've apprehended him, she says in Song of Solomon, I forgot what chapter, she goes, I found him who my soul has loved. And when I found him, I held him and I would not let him go. And she said, I pray that you would stay here and you would come to the place where my mother conceived me. In other words, she was so in love with him. She said, I want you to come into the place where I was conceived. I want you to be at the very forming of who I was and be that lover there. And for the rest of my life, the king has brought me into his chambers. The chambers of the Lord and the glory realm. Jesus said, listen. To his disciples, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go away. I'm going to go for a while, but I'm going to come back. But when I come back, I'm going to come and I'm going to take you. And I'm going to bring you that where I am. Because in my father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places. And I'm going to go. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And I'm going to bring you where I am. And this is what he said. That where I am, mm -mm -mm, that where I am, you shall also be. That where I am, you shall also be. Revelation 3.20, and to he that overcomes, will I grant him the right to sit down with me on my throne where I am, even as I sat down, even as I have overcome and sat down at my father's throne. I'm right next to my father and you'll be right next with me. This is the chambers, the place of authority, power, dominion. In that place, this glory realm, in these chambers of the Lord, the Lord is going to form a kingdom of kings and priests that are going to be able to rule and reign with him. He's going to form a bride that's going to come down as a new Jerusalem city and establish the government of God upon the earth. He's going to form a wheel within a wheel that's going to transform the kingdoms of this God into the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. And he's going to have an end time army of Joel that's, that is going to transform the kingdoms and release the cleansing judgments upon the earth. All of that comes as a result of this prayer of desire. So that's in love intercession. It's an intercession of personal desire to be personally one with the Lord and to be brought into the place where you can now be one with his purposes, his plans. I am my beloved and his desires are towards me. Now, the last part of this that I said, there's an in love, there's an in love words, in love prayer. And I want to show you the in love place. 
Now, I'm going to read on, and I'm going to backtrack next week with these scriptures, but I want to read on with you. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will recall your love more fragrant than wine. The upright are not offended at your choice, but sincerely love you. And then she describes herself. I am so black, sunburned, but you are lovely and pleasant. The ladies assured her, oh, you daughters of Jerusalem, I am dark as the tents of Kedar, like the beautiful curtains of Solomon. Please don't look at me, she says to him, for I am swarthy. I have worked out in the sun and it has left its mark upon me. My stepbrothers were angry with me and they made me keepers of the vineyard, but my own vineyard I have not kept. I'm going to talk about that next week. What is happening in this particular part, she is seeing him and she's like Isaiah. She's undone. Don't look at me, Lord. I see how beautiful you are. I see you like I've never seen you before. And in comparison, I am black and comely. I am sunburned, Lord. Why is she sun, sunburned? Because my stepbrothers, the church leadership, have made me the keepers of the vineyard. They were angry with me. Why were they angry with her? Get to work. Get to work. Why aren't you going out there winning the loss? There are people that need to be healed and saved and delivered and blah, 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 blah. This is what you should be doing. And, uh, and they beat her with that. You should be about your father's business. And yet her heart is burning in love for him. And they're saying, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. This is what you should be doing. And look, look at what happens in the church. They made me the keepers of the vineyard. They gave me a place. They gave me a position. I clean toilets. I'm the worship leader. I'm the children's ministry. And in, in thinking that in that place, they can be completely satisfied by the work. But anyone that loves, that loves the Lord can comes to a place, even as a pastor, the Bible minister, I don't want to do this anymore. Doing church every Sunday, doing all this evangelism, as wonderful as God is touching life, I'm still empty. There's still something lacking. There's still something burning inside of me that wants the Lord. And when that's awakened within you, when that love is awakened within you, you are now positioned to enter into the kingdom. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You're now positioned to enter into kingdom reality where you can be set apart for the Lord, for his finishing work. Those things, all those things of the ministries and the works are going to be done and he will use you with him to do it. But it won't be first in your life. It'll be the fruit of your life. It won't be the work of your life. It will be the expression of your life as it was with Jesus. The higher is always greater than the lesser. Thank you, Lord. I hope this is opening our eyes to see the kingdom tonight. And you can see, sadly, that many are probably aren't going to watch this broadcast. First of all, it's too long. <laughs> and second of all, it's not what they want to hear. But there are people who do want to hear. And there are people who will stay long enough to receive it. And then, this is where I want to finish tonight. I said there's in love words. There's in love intercession. This third part here, I would call in love repentance, which we'll talk about next week. Because I'll go back to it in a minute. Because she goes on to say, do not look at me. I'm swarthy. I'm, I've worked out in the sun and it's left its mark upon me. My stepbrothers were angry with me and they made me the keepers of the vineyards. But my own vineyard I have not kept. That is such a powerful word. What is she talking about? My own vineyard. My life with you. My in love with you I haven't kept. I've worked for you as an employee and employee, but my vineyard, my in love with you, my oneness with you, I haven't kept it. And it's burning in me to be one with you. It's burning in me to know you, to see you. All I want to do is be with you. I want to be in love with you. I want to be by your side. Wherever you go, I want to go. Whatever you do, I want to do. I don't want to go apart from you. I don't want to work for you. I don't want to do it in the way I've done it all my life in the church. I want to be one with you. So don't look at me. I'm sunburned, working so hard for you, Lord, that I never knew the Lord I was working for. But inside, I'm burning for you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I believe you do. Then he looks at, then she looks at him and she says these words. And I'm going to show you here the difference between the kingdom age ministers and the church age ministers. The church age ministers are the stepbrothers. And what do they do? They're not deliberately beating them. They don't even know they're beating them, but they beat me. Why? 
because what was of value to her was being crushed. What was the value of knowing him and being with him first above all things was being crushed by working for the Lord. Work was replacing their relationship. The second commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself was taking precedent over the first commandment, which was love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's the sin in the church that has caused all of what we see happening in the church today. We put the second commandment above the first and she realizes it. And when she looks to find him, she does notice he's not in that place. In this book, in the marriage supper, he's not there. Matter of fact, the call is, behold, the bride with cometh, go out to meet him, which means he's surely not in the camp where we thought he would be. Okay. <laughs> you know, the holy place may be there with his presence. The outer courts may be there with the altar, uh, with, the, with, the, with the labor and all the things there, but the ark is not there. The ark has moved. The ark has found a new home outside the camp in a new tent where she had to come to find him just like today. And I'll wrap it up here. And she says this, addressing her shepherd, tell me, O oh, you whom you love, where do you pasture your flocks? Will you make it to lie down at noon? For why should I be like, as I think of you, be a veiled one or strain beside the flocks of your companions? What, is she, what does that mean? She says, where are you tending your flocks? She sees him and she sees these sheep near him. A sheep that are not the same as the ones that are inside the camp, the ones where the stepfather is. She goes, where are you feeding them? Where are you feeding these sheep? Where are they going? Where are they dwelling? What are they finding that I don't have? Why should I be like someone veiled, like where I can't see you? They can see you. Why can't I? And this is the difference between the church age leadership and the kingdom age leadership. The church age leadership is going to bring you back to being a stepbrother. Back to their vineyards, back to their ministries, back to their calling, back to what they're building. But the kingdom ministers will do no such, no such things. And matter of fact, they are so trusted by the Lord to take this bride, this awakening love. He actually sends them to him. And listen what he says. He says, if you don't know where, the, where your lover is, oh, you find this among women, follow the tracks of the flock and amuse yourself by the, and pasturing by the kids be, beside the shepherd's tents. Notice he has shepherds outside the camp. Who are they? They are forerunners. They are the kingdom people, the kingdom fathers and mothers and of the Lord who have come out of that system, who have been dealt with as a Lord, who had the work of the Lord that this book is going to talk about done within them. And they now no longer see the Lord as their employee but he is the lover of their soul and their purpose and their mission and their work to the body of Christ, to this bride is never to bring them to themselves or to their ministries. They are pointers. They are ones who have been with the Lord. They have a spiritual substance so different than what you see in the church age and church age ministries that, that it draws you to them like a magnet. You could listen to them for hours and hours and hours because they have a spiritual substance from God. They have the kingdom within them. They have that in love words, that in love prayer, that in love, and they speak differently. They talk differently. And everything that they impart from the Lord is his substance. And it brings God glory and they see the Lord. They don't see the minister. They don't see their ministry. Matter of fact, when they're done, done, they have been like John the Baptist who have decreased and Jesus increased and their ministry works has caused those that have come to them to love him more, to run after him. And they point, this is the way of the Lord. This is the way. And what they do is they help them on that path to find the Lord themselves. And their mission is never to make them dependent upon them, upon their service, upon their ministry, about them feeding them. They teach them how to feed from the Lord themselves. They bring them from childhood into maturity. They learn how to take their hands, lift it up into the Lord's hands. And when they get a hold of the Lord's hand themselves, they let go and they get out of the way. This is a ministry outside the church. It's a ministry of the kingdom. It's a ministry of kingdom ministers and, and the fivefold ministries will function completely different outside the camp. I've been saying it over and over. Now I'm telling you why, because it has a different destination. It has a different foundation. It has the third day kingdom age foundation in it, the completion. It has the alpha and the omega. In the church age, we only have the alpha, but in the kingdom age, we have the alpha and the, and the omega. And he instructs them to go find them. 
I was blessed when all of this happened in my life, when the Lord ended the ministry as I knew it to be, took our church from 200 down to two, you know, and broke me and crushed me because of that desire, because I had that in me. And thank God he didn't let me stay as my employer. He completely delivered me from it. And I found a shepherd outside the camp called Way Taylor. And I had never, what I had burning in my heart, what God was teaching me alone, this man knew. And when I met him, I, this is a real apostle of the Lord, a real father in the Lord, or a mature one of the kingdom age, I'll put it that way. Not better, I'm just saying he was. And the thing that the Lord had told me when I had, when my other spiritual father took my credentials away from me because I wouldn't keep the services less than two minutes and, and, and that I was singing prophetically, he said, I can't do that. If you keep doing that, I'm going to remove your credentials. So I left. I gave the credentials back. And then the Lord said, I'm going to bring a spiritual father in your life. And this is how you're going to know him. He's going to love you like I do. And when I met Brother Taylor for the first time, he invited me to prayer. Got up at six o'clock in the morning. And when this man just sat there like this, waited on the Lord and God's manifested presence came, he said very few words. It was so powerful. And the people that pray, I mean, I've never been in a prayer meeting like this where the draw me, we will run after you was in reality. It was so powerful. I mean, I, I was weeping and God was speaking to me. And after everybody left, I had a meeting with him. And before you even started, I was caught up as he spoke. I was literally caught up into heaven while he was speaking. And he spoke directly to my spirit. And a spiritual substance was so deposited in me that changed my life forever from the Lord. And the Lord said, this is him. This is a father I told you about. This was a shepherd outside the camp. And I stayed really with him for over 25 years. I, 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 I don't know how many times I met him because I lived quite a ways away from him. But when I needed to talk to him, he always brought me to Jesus. His guidance was perfect. He never brought me to him, to his ministry. He never demanded me submitting to him, never demanded me be faithful to him, never said those words, never came out of his mouth, never, never. Matter of fact, the opposite came out of his mouth. He said, Henry, I know many. He said, I never wanted to be a spiritual father in the Lord, and I resisted it. But the Lord said I had to be, that there would be many out there that would need that, and that he would show me how to do it. He said, if anybody has to demand that you submit to their authority, that's not a, an authority that you need to submit to. He says, Brother Henry, if I have something from God that's worth submitting to, it will be the God in me that you'll submit to, and you'll do it willingly and freely. Never forced, never asked for. And you know what? He never did. And I willingly and lovingly submitted to that Christ within him. And this counsel was spot on every single time, guided me. He was one of the few people I could ever talk to about the glory realm, besides Ron McGatlin Ron McG Ron McG Ron from Open Heaven. Because I really met Ron after Wade went home with the Lord. And Ron's another one of those spiritual fathers just like that. They have that substance, that quality. They are shepherds outside of the tent. They don't bring you to them. They don't ask you for anything. They don't ask you to do anything. That's the amazing thing. What they do is they bring you to the Lord. And as they bring you to the Lord, you become everything that God created you and the doing flows out of you like a river. That's the shepherds outside of the camp. That's their purpose and their plan. And those of you that are being drawn out of the church age, out of the church religious system, will be led by the Lord to many times to, to men and women like that. He won't let them replace him in your life. He will not let them replace your love for them with him. They, they know how to decrease so that the Lord will increase, but he will, he will let you be trained by them, by what he trained them by, to a point where you can find the Lord for yourselves. And that begins a new journey out of the church age, into the kingdom age, into the glory realm. And this is where the fivefold ministry now works in conjunction with Jesus as a cornerstone and Jesus as a finishing stone. And now they're laid here. And they, instead of being over us in the church age and crushing the stones underneath it, like what happens in churches, many, they, very many people are even realize pastors don't even know what's inside of their people because they have a, a mission. We got a vision. We got to make that vision. So everybody shh, go this way and everybody goes that way. And people are buried. With, with what they are, their gifts, their callings. There's no place for them. There's no room at the end. But in the kingdom age, God takes that foundation and he brings it right down where it's supposed to be, underneath us, so that he can lift us all up. 
those gifts given to help you become everything that God created you to be. And in that, we begin to mature. And the thing is that these spiritual shepherds outside the camp, they are there in your lives for occasions and seasons, not to be worshiped. They get out of the way and, and they rejoice when you are alone with the Lord. They're not calling you say, where, where were you last Sunday? Where were you last Sunday? Why weren't you in church? They would never say that. Because they know by the spirit of God where you are, you're spending quality time with God. You're in love with the Lord. They know you're growing in your own with the Lord. You're knowing the Lord. The Lord's knowing you. And they pray for you. And they and they lift you before the Lord. And when God speaks to them, then they say something. If God doesn't, he doesn't. And if he shows them something, maybe they just pray. They're not there to control you. They're not there to, to, to tell you what to do this way or that way. Because you're not a child anymore. They don't see you as a child having to learn from them, be taught by them, be spoon fed by them. They see you as a growing adult and they give you the freedom properly within the right boundaries and give you the guidance so that you can grow. They're there. They're praying. They're interceding. They're there to help you. But they know that it's God that's going to be working. with They understand when we go later about a, what a garden and clothes my sister, my bride means. And they dare not touch it. Their ministry is different. And, and compared to what the church age ministry looks like, it's going to look like they don't care about you because they're not always after you, not always telling you what to do, not always correcting you and doing every, you know, they're not doing that. That's what you do with children. But they see you're not a child. That you're maturing. And they give you correction when it's needed by God. And most of the time, you're the one that's seeking them out for the correction and the direction because the relationship's different. Such is the kingdom age. Beloved, all of this together is as this in love relationship bursts within you. The Lord is going to draw you deeper and deeper in his heart. He's going to rearrange your life, rearrange your plans. We will run after you. He's going to change the people that are speaking into your life, the people that you fellowship with. If you're hungry and desiring, because you may not be able to keep the old relationships as you've known them to be, because they're not going that way. But there are brand new ones that God has for you that will strengthen you and you'll strengthen them as you all pursue the Lord together. And that's why the Lord is having put in my heart to do these divine convergences, because it's to those that are outside of that camp or being drawn outside of that camp. There is a desire for us to come together and meet the Lord. The Lord wants us to meet with him. So that's it for tonight. I went on a little bit longer, but that's all right. You know, people don't have to watch it. If they don't want it, they can leave whenever they need to. It's here. You can watch this in parts later because I know it's a lot at one time, but I don't, I, I, I would have been a miss if I didn't finish the, the whole thought that God is downloading in me tonight. Glory has a language. It's an in love language. It's a, in love words, in love intercession, and in love place outside the camp. And on next um, Monday night, I'll share about in love repentance because that's the key to overcoming. And maybe that's why the Lord had me leave it off for night. But there's an in love repentance that is absolutely necessary to bring us into the fullness of that in love glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Has God touched you tonight? Send a thumbs, thumbs up. Is this ministering to your heart? Is the Lord changing you tonight? Are you meeting the Lord? If you are, just give him a thumbs up or something or a heart or just let the Lord, let's give him praise. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We bless you tonight, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'll put some hearts on there myself today, Lord. You are changing me, Lord. I give you praise. I give you glory, Lord. And Father, I just lift up my brothers and sisters who are watching this live and those that will watch it later. I ask you to take this word and make it flesh, make it our life's experience. May that Shulamite's prayer of desire be our prayer. Lord. May the reality of what draw me, we will run after you. The king brings me into, into his chambers. Let, it, let that intercessory prayer, that desperation prayer for you become a living reality within us and come in and feed us, Lord. We desire you. We want to know the kisses of yours. I pray such a release 
such a strengthening, such a quickening, such an impartation to my brothers and sisters that are watching this live and who will come to watch it. Lord, I pray such a stirring, such an activation of your presence, your parousia, God, to quicken within each and every one to bring us higher and deeper into the depth of your love. Lord, I thank you right now for your manifested presence. I thank you for your drawing. I thank you for your approbation, Lord, your favor upon your people. And I thank you that you're give, giving us a single eye, a dove's eyes toward you, Lord. And Father, I pray such release and strengthening and let this, let your glory be seen risen upon us and let it touch our husbands, our wives, our mothers, our fathers, our children, our sisters, our brothers, our uncles, our aunts and niece. Let them see your glory. Fill us with your glory, Lord, so that, Lord, this world will see you. They'll see you in us, Lord. You'll be magnified that, Lord, that you would be lifted up in our life and you would draw all men onto you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're bringing us out of this wilderness and we're going to be leaning upon you, our beloved. And whatever ministry work, whatever you have for us, we will do together as one with you, Lord. Wherever you're going to lead us, wherever we're going to go, whatever you desire to do, we will do it as one. And you will receive all the glory and all the honor and the praise. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Well, if you just join in, I just encourage you to go back and listen to it. This was a very, I think, and maybe I'm biased a little bit, I don't know, but I think this was a very strong and powerful impartation word of the Lord from the Lord himself, taking us up higher, explaining the entrances into the ways of the kingdom and into the glory realm. There's a glory language, there's a glory intercession, there's a glory place. And on Monday, we'll talk about glory repentance. Amen. Thank you for watching tonight. You are all a blessing. I love each and every one of you. And if we can serve you in any way, please message me on Facebook or you can email me at go at flameoffire2007.org. You know, and uh, I want to remind you about the divine convergence. If you haven't heard about it, we're going to have a uh, 20 something days from now, 29 days from now, I guess, or 30 days from now. We'll be gathering together, all of those outside the camp, I guess in Loveland, Colorado at the Embassy Suites for three days of divine convergence where the agenda is just meeting the Lord. That's it. And if you go on the website, okay, you, you'll, you know, you can find out the information on our website and go to the events page. But if you want to know about it, I did a special broadcast yesterday. It's called Blow the Shofar. And it's all about the call to converge. If you want to know what a convergence is, listen to that video. I'm telling you, it was so enlightening from God. And he spoke about why we could converge, what he's going to do in the convergence, and why we're coming to Colorado. So please, if you are, have any witness, if the Holy Spirit is quickening about this convergence, watch that video because it explains what it is and what the Lord wants to do. I have no idea what's going to happen, but why we're coming there, the Lord explained to us last night. So please watch that video. It's right here on this Facebook page, and it's also on our YouTube channel. Go that flame of fire. Kingdom, Kingdom Awakening Messengers. You can either watch it. If you watch the YouTube one, it's finished. That's the better one to watch than my Facebook one because there's some editing that my son does on and making it all set. So praise God. Hallelujah. Um, lastly, as I always do, thank you for all of you that have been praying for us and all of you that have been encouraging us and those of you who have been blessing us financially. Sometimes we have new people and they're so touched by the Lord. They say, how can we bless you? Well, it's on the website. We have a website. It's right there on the on the chat line. And we have a PayPal account. And if God, no, you don't have to, but we're blessed if you do. We're blessed if God touches you. And we're blessed if God doesn't touch you because he has those that he wants to touch. But we appreciate every single one that's praying for us, encouraging us, and blessing us financially. And for me to get to Colorado, I'm going to need an intervention of the Lord. Because as a missionary, I have to raise those funds. So I'd ask you to pray about it. You know, I have a certain amount that I need. I kind of budgeted it out already. And so I'm asking the Lord for it. And I know God will get me there. He always does. And there are other people too that need to get there. I'm going to pray for them that God will bring them what they need as well. So thank you for those of you praying for us. Please pray for this, this trip, for this convergence. Please pray for us for the means to get there. And pray for, you know, and uh, 
and uh, and all the expenses that come with doing it because it's not free. It costs money to do it, of course, but God has it. And we believe God for it, you know? So, amen. If God touches your heart to bless us as as, as missionaries and, 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 you know, that's what helps us to live and pay our bills. And that's and just like, you, you, just like, you know, you trust the Lord for, to take care of yours. That's what we have to do. And we're so grateful when God touches somebody. And we're, you know, and please, I don't see people who give, you know, um, you know, any different than anyone else. I'm just blessed by their giving. You know, they're, that the God, I mean, we love all the saints, but there are those that connect with you in even a deeper, intimate covenant relationship of giving and receiving, like the church of Philippi did with Paul. And they got a very special blessing. My God shall supply all your needs because they entered into that partnership of, of love blessings with them. And they did it of their free will. And I know God has people like that for us too. And many of you are those people. And we thank God for you. And we appreciate you. Every one of you, whether you give or you don't. You know, whether you pray for us or you don't, we love you. <laughs> Amen. Love isn't, it, it's not, no strings attached. We're here to serve you, no strings attached. But to say we're not grateful for when God touches people, well, then we would not be telling the truth. We are very grateful when the Lord touches people to pray for us, encourage us, and to bless us. And we thank him for it. And we pray those blessings upon each and every one of you. If you need anything, if we can serve you in any way, email me, Facebook me, and we will be in touch with you. If you need prayer for anything, let us know so we can stand with you. That's it for tonight. God bless you. Have a great evening, a great weekend. And today is Thursday. And I may I may go on spontaneously over the weekend. So just keep uh, keep looking for it. Last night I did a, like a five minute notice one. So many of you probably didn't even know I went on last night. But please listen to last night's video. It's called Sound the Shofar. You'll see it. It's called The Call to Converge. Please don't miss it. All right. Love you all. God bless. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.